in a burnt out bulb. <laughs> um, Great. Just a second. And they were pretty easy to fix. So I've transitioned to the next generation of uh, presentations. There you go. <laughs> um, so this is just one of the topics that I cover in my career as a park naturalist. So I don't like to present myself as a railroad expert. I don't know everything there is to know about the topic, but I became very passionate about this subject years ago. And um, I worked it into my uh, various presentations, both uh, PowerPoint as well as uh, van trips, which we were doing in earnest before COVID taking people around to visit these sites in person, along with other topics like bird watching and uh, bo uh, botany and ghost towns of the Pine Barrens. Those are some of our more popular ones. But today we're doing an armchair tour of this uh, railroad. This is a map uh, from one of my two main references, the uh, Tuckerton Railroad by John Brinkman. And it lists or shows in the on the image, the different railroads that were in Ocean County. So we have the, is my cursor showing on the presentation? Yes. Okay, so we have the New Jersey Southern here, which later became the central of New Jersey. That cuts across the uh, upper corner. And also the Pennsylvania Railroad, which went across the top, that connected with uh, Camden and a ferry crossing from Philadelphia to the west and to the east that crossed the Barnegat Bay and went north, uh, landing in Seaside Park, then went north to uh, northern New Jersey by a variety of routes and other lines. So the Tuckerton Railroad depended on these two lines for their connection with the outside world. It was the only one of the railroads in Ocean County that was in its entirety in Ocean County. So it started at Whiting, or in the map it's called Whiting's here. We'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. And then the main line went down to Tuckerton. Then about a year after it started in 1871, a spur was built to the Edge Cove on Little Egg Harbor Bay. And from there, railroad owned steamboats took passengers across the bay to uh, initially to Bonds, uh, Thomas uh, Bonds uh, Hotel. Um, and then later the uh, Many of the investors of the Tuckerton Railroad also invested heavily in a new resort in what's now Beach Haven. Uh, one of the investors was Charles Parry, the president of the Baldwin Locomotive Works in Philadelphia, where the Tuckerton Railroad got the majority of its locomotives. He built a hotel um, that called the Parry House, later the uh, Baldwin Hotel, named after the founder of that company. So the railroad was heavily invested in um, the uh, destination for this new line. Then later on in 1894, the Pennsylvania Railroad financed a spur up through Manahawkin across the bay. And at that point we had an all rail route to Long Beach Island going north to Barnegat City, which is now Barnegat Light and south to Beach Haven. Originally it was projected to go further south, but that never occurred. And that, because of that, uh, the resort at Bonds languished and eventually was uh, abandoned. Um, but Long Beach Island, however, did de depend on the railroad for its development. There were little fishing shacks and small communities there before the railroad, but it really took off once rail traffic came to that uh, piece of land. So going back to Whiting, this is the Whiting station. It was, um, originally the spot where the Raritan and Delaware Bay Railroad came through, chartered in 1854. It wasn't until the early 1860s, or 1860 or 61, I believe, it came through this area. But then that became the New Jersey Southern, then uh, the central of New Jersey, and then finally in 1976, it was Conrail. By the 1950s, this was only freight going through here, passenger service had stopped. But during the golden era of the railroads, this station serviced all three railroads, the Pennsylvania Railroad and the New Jersey Central. And then also it was where the, the northern terminus of the uh, Tuckerton Railroad. And I mentioned the name Whiting's. The earliest timetables for the Raritan and Delaware Bay, and then later the New Jersey Southern, listed the stop, stop as Whiting's Mill. And that was because Nathan Whiting had a steam powered sawmill here and sold the railroad, the land to build the station. 
So that was listed on the uh, railroad timetables as Whiting's Mill. Then later on, it was the mill was taking off and it was just shortened to Whiting's. And you will see that on pretty much all of the railroad timetables after that point, including the Tucker and the Railroad. And when I first moved to Ocean County in the early 1980s, I still heard some people, especially old timers, refer to Whiting as Whiting's. So that name died a slow death, but you don't hear it too much anymore. But here is an example of the Tucker and Railroad timetable from uh, 1874. And you could see uh, the listing of Whiting's for that stop. This was an aerial photograph from approximately 1955 of the Whiting Junction. This was uh, about 20 years after the Tucker Railroad had been out of business. You could see just the dirt path where the tracks once were. The vacant turntable, the mechanism uh, removed, is still visible. The uh, station, of course, is still standing, but not used anymore. The Pennsylvania Railroad tracks going from uh, Ocean Gate to Camden are still there, but they have been abandoned at this point. And the New Jersey Central tracks still in place and still being used for freight, primarily sand and gravel. This is what the turntable pit looks like now. When Station Road was built on top of the old abandoned Tuckard and Railroad bed, uh, the western half of this turntable was bulldozed in. So you could see the rubble on the west side. Uh, in recent years, and I believe it may have been part of an Eagle Scout project, I'm not sure, but a sidewalk was built from Station Road, which you can see in the upper right-hand side, up to the turntable, permitting people to uh, observe this uh, uh, relic of the Tucker and Railroad without walking on uh, either muddy grass or maybe exposing yourself to ticks, which as a naturalist, uh, we're always uh, concerned about. Going further south along the Tucker and Railroad right away, parallel to uh, Lacey Road, when you come to the uh, village of Bamber, uh, you'll find uh, just on the west side of Lacey Road, a hole in the ground with some concrete and brick foundation. This is the rem remains of the Bamber Station. Originally, it was named on the Tucker and Railroad timetables as Farago Station after the ironworks that was built by uh, General John Lacey in the early 1800s, and who uh, Lacey Road is named after, which was the road he built to get his iron products to Forked River and then be loaded on the ships. But that was long gone when the railroad started, but they did name the station in honor of that enterprise, but it was sh shortly changed to the station of Bamber. Then just a little bit south of there where Cedar Creek crosses or goes under Lacey Road rather, just adjacent to the road, if you look in the creek, again on the western side, you'll see some pilings and some horizontal timbers. These are all the remains of the railroad trestle, which once carried the Tuckerton Railroad. Then just south of this point, and incidentally, of this presentation, we're going to be mixing a scattering of historic slides, and just as in the van trip that we offer, the goal is primarily to give you a taste or a view of what is still left to see, the evidence that remains from the Tuckerton Railroad. So going a little further south, the railroad turns uh, a little more to the east, away from um, Lacey Road, southeast, and goes into the Forked River Mountain Tract. This was an image that was given to me by the New Jersey Division of Parks and Forestry. Someone had taken this many years ago out in the woods, and it was an old Tucker Railroad passenger car that was removed from the trucks, which are the part with the wheels, and it was used as a uh, little open-ended garage for a vehicle that was used uh, perhaps for either charcoal making or uh, wood gathering. Then the road uh, the line approaches Route 9 in uh, Waretown, uh, a place called Waretown Junction, then parallels Route 9 down to Barnegat, where we come to the next uh, present uh, remains of the Tuckerton Railroad. Here is an old postcard showing the Barnegat Station 
as well as the uh, freight house off to the left. And if you look, it's a little bit faded in the image, you could see the water tower. Now this is now uh, part of, this is that water tower is actually the um, old CNJ water tower, which the line paralleled the Tuckerton Railroad. And if you walk that now, that's, which is part of the rail trail uh, that was implemented by Ocean County Parks, you can see a display at that point and the concrete remains of the footing from that water tower. And this is a close up of the Barnegat station after it was abandoned in its original location. Then it was moved just a few feet to the west of where it is now on the other side of the road. And here's what it looks like now. There's been a few additions, but you could see the original architecture of this station. Uh, when I first saw it, when I moved to Ocean County, a woman lived in there by herself and she had the whole thing printed a bright pink color, uh, including the shutters and other woodwork and as well as the siding. So it, I saw a for sale sign on it and I always thought it'd be interesting to live in a uh, railroad station, but I couldn't get past that pink color, even though I knew it could be changed and it was probably a little too small. If you go a little bit south on that road that we just viewed in front of the railroad station, you'll cross uh, East or West Bay Ave, Route 554. And on the left side of the road, there's a structure with tracks still on it. This was known as a coal trestle. And if you look at it from the end, you can see the concrete piers or bins where the coal was dumped. And then the uh, wooden trestle on top with the rail still remaining. So hopper cars filled with coal would have been backed up the ramp onto this trestle and hopper cars are freight cars which are loaded from the top and then unloaded from chutes in the bottom. So the coal would have been dumped into the bins or a vehicle would have been, a truck would have been put backed underneath and loaded with coal. And then in a few days, the railroad would pick up the empty hoppers. So the only reason this still exists is when the Tucker and Railroad went out of business in, um, 1940, uh, which was actually a successor company to the Tucker and Railroad, the New Jersey Central made arrangements, which ended at Bay Ave, just a little bit to the north of here, made arrangements with the former Tucker and Railroad to connect to this uh, siding so it can continue to deliver, deliver coal to primarily the Conrad Brothers Lumber Company, which was in um, Barnegat up to, up to that time. Then going a little further south, if um, I believe it's Stafford Road, uh, where the uh, along Route 9, where the 84 lumber is, there's a dirt road going into the woods. This is on the east side of Route 9 now. And if you walk down this road a little bit, going to the north, as I did on this uh, snowy day, I saw something unusual. I had never seen railroad ties, although I saw other relics, I never saw railroad ties from the Tucker and Railroad still in the ground, other than the coal trestle. And because the snow was melting in an unusual pattern here, I brushed it away in some of the leaves and pine needles and uh, uh, there were the railroad ties. So the difference between the railroad ties and the soil and leaves on either side caused the snow to melt at different rates. And if it wasn't for that, I would have never known they were there. So these are the only railroad ties still in place. When a line is scrapped, typically the, the or abandoned, the rails will be taken for either use elsewhere or for use as metal scrap, but the tie, old ties have no value. So they were just left in place. But this is something you can still see. And you could go down this road legally. This is part of the Ocean County Natural Land Trust property, which are uh, properties that are purchased with a voter approved uh, tax fund and it acquires land to keep it in its natural condition to preserve open space and it is available to the public to use. Then we come down to Manahawkin where we find another relic of the railroad still standing, although not in this spot. This was the Manahawkin station and it was located on the corner of Stafford and the Letts Road where uh, Larry's Barbershop is now, I believe. And this is a picture when it was abandoned. And then in, I believe it was 1990, 
the uh, Stafford Historical Society had this moved to Heritage Park, which is across the street from A. Paul King Park, the county park. And it was uh, restored and is now one of the museum structures for the Stafford Historical Society. And this is what it looks like now. And other than new siding uh, and uh, new shingles, it's pretty much unlike the Barnegat Station in its, in its original condition. Now, this is a widely circulated postcard. I've seen this a number, it published in a number of uh, books and um, still trying to get an original copy of it. But if you look at this image, you have the Manahawken station to your left and a steam engine stopped on the main line, the uh, uh, freight house behind it. And then there's a passing siding where freight cars or passenger cars that had to stop for any length of time to unload cargo or such uh, would be out of the way of the main line. And on that platform is a uh, baggage cart, which would be used to get people's luggage or parcels being delivered uh, over to the freight house. And if you look at the next slide, we'll see what the Historical Society did. They located some tracks that they obtained as well as a wooden platform and an old original baggage cart to duplicate the image of that slide. So that was a, a neat way to uh, set up that site. Also there is an old uh, work shack, which was or tool shed, which was located along the rails um, on Long Beach Island just after the rails reached um, the island from uh, the Bonnet Islands. So work tool sheds like this will be located at regular intervals along the tracks and it would have the tools that would be used to uh, replace ties uh, or, or, or um, rails or just any maintenance work that needed to be done. This particular one also originally had rails in it for a small hand cart that could then be used to go up and down the track to ac access other areas. Another relic here, which I remember seeing in its original location is the crossing in Whiting where the Tuckerton Railroad met the New Jersey Central and the Pennsylvania Railroad. And this is where those two larger lines crossed. So the amount of traffic that this particular piece of track saw is virtually hard to imagine. Um, all the north-south trains on the New Jersey Central, including the famous Blue Comet would have traveled on this. All the trains coming from uh, Camden to uh, uh, the Barnegat Bay and further north or going to the Tuckerton Railroad would have crossed on this as well. So this, this is, may not seem significant to someone not familiar with it, but it's uh, very significant to rail historians. The other thing we have in this image is some concrete piers. These were rescued from a section of uh, uh, just off on the south side of Route 72 and the west, I'm sorry, east side of Route 9. And these were the bases of a water tower on the Tuckerton Railroad on the, the route that went to Long Beach Island. And there were several water towers on the Tuckerton Railroad, but this particular tower was the largest one. Another uh, article you might see if you visit this site is an old passenger car. It's been lettered for the Tuckerton Railroad, but this isn't actually a type of car that didn't exist till much later. They were referred to as steel heavyweight coaches and a, a bit larger than what would have operated on the Tuckerton Railroad. This was obtained from Earl Naval Weapons Station, where it was used as a um, teaching facility on the site. And when it was no longer needed, it was uh, donated to the Historical Society and it was moved down here and repainted as a Tucker to Railroad car in honor of the railroad that went through this area. Although again, it's important to remember that where this station is, the railroad did not pass. The railroad passed or went through this area on the east side of Route 9. This park is on the west side of Route 9. Here's an old interior shot of that station. And you could see the workers there posing for the picture and the articles of a mail there on the shelves. Um, 
the next slide will see what it looks like now. One wall has been removed, but the arched window separating the employee from the public section is still evident there. And most of the rest of the station is um, original as well. You can see a variety of artifacts and photographs and maps from the railroad history. And there's several other buildings in Manahawk and from the Historical Society, um, at least one other on that site. Now, if we go back to where the main line was on the east side of Route 9, this is where it crossed Bay Avenue. And there's still a uh, dirt road going into the woods that was the railroad right of way. And you could see a, a convenience store or Bay Ave Farms. Um, this picture I took at least 10, maybe 15 years ago, but that's still there. Then if you follow that road a little to the south, it comes out to Route 72 on the west side of the Moose Lodge. And you could see a picnic table from their little uh, picnic area. Then backing up to the other side of uh, Route 72, the south side, but looking in that same direction, um, you'll see uh, an embankment of fill going through wetlands. And this is at the start of what was called the Y. And the reason it was called the Y is it usually had a straight section and two curved section. So this was used for two purposes. Either it was to take you someplace else off that, that line, like in this case, to Long Beach Island, or it, in some cases, the stub was shorter and it was used to make a K turn to turn the uh, train around or just the engine around instead of having to uh, use a turntable like we saw up in Whiting. So this Y was uh, created in 1886 um, and paid for by the Pennsylvania Railroad to access Long Beach Island. So uh, the Tuckerton Railroad operated met on this stretch, but it was owned by the Pennsylvania Railroad. And here's the aerial photograph from 1930 of that same site. So you could see uh, East Bay Ave, the uh, railroad, and what's now Route 9. And incidentally, when this was abandoned in the early 1940s, eventually Route 72 was built over much of the former Tuckerton Railroad bed going to the bay. Traveling a little further east, crossing over the uh, causeway, we come to uh, a group of islands on some old maps. They're collectively called the Cedar Bona Islands. On more modern um, government maps, the US Geological Survey maps, they divide them as the smaller one being Bona Island and the larger one, Cedar Bona Island. But some people will argue about what the actual names are, and those debates can be interesting. But in this aerial photograph, which was taken fairly recently, you could still see remains of the railroad. There's a little bit of fill here in this section of Salt Marsh, and a little bit here, um, just leading up to the uh, Bona Island estates. And then, of course, on Bona Island, you have Railroad Ave. So many places, the street names are um, a nod to the history of that area. So walking out on the section of Salt Marsh uh, with my nice comfortable rubber boots through the mud, mud and marsh, I took this picture of a narrow strip of uh, red cedars and other tr small trees and shrubs. And looking up close, you could see why they're growing in the salt marsh. There is fill in that area, and that's the old fill from the railroad grade. And in some cases, that fill might be uh, stone or gravel. In this case, much of it were cinders that were a waste product from the uh, process of burning coal for combustion to heat the water in the steam engine. So that continually had to be gotten rid of. And it, the most common use was spreading along the railroad grade to uh, fill wet spots or raise low spots. <clears throat> Turning around and looking to the east from that same spot, we see the Bona Island Estate, which is a uh, popular uh, venue for weddings and other large parties. 
on the other side of the uh, thoroughfare there, you can also see the Dutchman's restaurant. But again, you have a narrow line of trees growing where they otherwise would not have grown, and that's because of the railroad fill. As you travel south on the Garden State Parkway into Atlantic County and Cape May County, you can see this a couple times as you look to the east, and they are segments of the old Pennsylvania Reading Seashore lines where there's nothing remaining but these the vegetation from a distance at least. Then once we come on to Long Beach Island, there's not a whole lot left of the railroad. One thing that's very visible, although not apparent uh, significance to many, are these little short segments of road that are cut out from the main parts of uh, Long Beach Boulevard. And there are several different places along that road. And what and it's an unusual road arrangement that doesn't seem to make sense, but that's because they were built on passing sidings where refrigerated freight cars were parked for the old pound fisheries, which the pound fisheries are a type of net that are uh, strung from poles out in the surf. If you visit the Tuckerton Seaport, you can see excellent displays in one of the buildings on the pound fisheries. So these iced box ca box cars would be left and filled with fish, and then they would be picked up at another day or so and taken to the metropolitan markets, which because of the railroads were only a couple hours away. Before the railroads, the seafood that was caught in the bay and the ocean in this area uh, didn't have as much of a market because it was difficult to get it to market while it was still fresh. It had to be put in barrels and salted, but now you could have uh, the fishermen in this area had a ready market for their products, and it caused many more people to pursue those livelihoods. And then other items shipped from here would have been uh, seaweed for fertilizer and gelatin, um, eel grass, which was used for stuffing mattresses and furniture and also used for insulation in buildings. It was very common on the steamships of the old days to have eel grass stuffed mattresses, which were considered disposable after a few uses. So that was just one of the products that would have been shipped from here. Then at one point, the Pennsylvania Railroad reorganized, actually several points, reorganized the lines on Long Beach Island. And it was split into two railroads, the Barnegat Railroad going north to Barnegat Light, and then the Philadelphia and Beach Haven going south to Beach Haven. The Barnegat Railroad was then abandoned because of last, lack of traffic. And a new company was formed by a group of investors called the Manahawken and Long Beach Transportation Company. And uh, this was one of the engines, which you can't see in this black and white photo, but the green and yellow color caused it to be named the Yellow Jacket. And it only operated for a few years before it too fell to the uh, lack of business on that section of line. Then at the north, the only uh, station still standing on Barnegat uh, or Long Beach Island is the Barnegat Light Station. And this is now a uh, private home. So I don't like to give the exact location where it is because some people like to um, unfortunately trespass to get better photographs and the people owning these buildings get tired of that very quickly. So, um, but if you're a good detective, you can find it on your own, which is what I had to do. And it took me quite a while. And that makes it even more fun though. Then going back to the South, we have a couple of historic photographs. This is the station at Beach Haven Terrace and it gives you a good contrast. Some of the stations were regular stops like the Barnegat Light Station or the Beach Haven Station. And others were what were called flag stops. So you, uh, there would be a flag that you would stick in a holder or perhaps wave to the train if you needed it to stop. Otherwise, the train would just pass by and only stop at one of the regular scheduled stops. Then this is a postcard of the Beach Haven Station. A lot of the images um, are, can be obtained from postcards of a lot of her historic subjects. And there are many ones of the various railroad stations available. This is the station after it was abandoned. And unfortunately it was demolished. So this is uh, no longer standing, but this was the Southern extent of the railroad on Long Beach Island. And here was the only uh, color photograph. That postcard was colorized, but this was an actual color photograph while it was still standing. 
Then going back to Route 9, uh, joining the mainland, if we go south just a little bit, we come to Mill Creek, which is the creek that drains out of Manahawkin Lake. And um, my wife never understands why I'm excited by things like this little stick uh, poking out of the water. But this is all that remains of the wooden railroad trestle that crossed Mill Creek. Then we have an image of the Cedar Run station, which again, unfortunately, is no longer there. Then the railroad comes back out to Route 9, what's now Route 9, and crosses over at a place called Cox Crossing Road. There was a farm there owned by a man of that name. And up till not too long ago, you could still see a railroad tie um, poking out of the asphalt, but that's been paved over and presumably still there, maybe to make its appearance some future date. Caitlin, is everything still seem to be going okay? I haven't heard any signs of life other than my own. No, everything's great. Nope. Okay, um, just wanted yeah. to make sure I wasn't all by myself here accidentally. <laughs> no, you're good. Um, there are some questions filling in, um, uh, but I think they will be, I think some of them you're answering as you go. Um, so I think we'll wait to maybe check in and see if um, there are any more at the end. So, um, but keep on going for right now. Okay, yeah, if something pops up uh, along those lines that you think best answer right there, um, I can pause. Otherwise I can take any at the end that haven't been addressed. Okay, sounds good. So just after it crosses a Route 9 at Cox Crossing, the right of way goes through a one of Clayton Sand and Gravel's yards. This was actually used for um, shipping sand and gravel when the railroad was still uh, functioning. Uh, the railroad had a lot of financial difficulties almost from the outset. It never made a lot of money. Uh, and ironically, towards the end, it made a, quite a bit of money hauling sand and gravel and also cement that was shipped in from elsewhere to build our road automobile road system, which of course was part of what was the uh, doom of many railroad lines, the competition from cars and trucks. But money to be made could not be avoided. So it, the railroad did take advantage of that market. But here is where the railroad line exits the Clayton um, yard. And from that point south, it becomes the aptly named Railroad Ave in uh, West Creek and then the Parkertown section of Little Egg Harbor. <clears throat> and then again, ironically, uh, that name is lost as soon as it enters Tuckerton, uh, considering it's the Tuckerton Railroad. This is an image of a flood, I believe in 1936, which washed out a section of the tracks in West Creek. Uh, that was a common problem with railroads, uh, storms like we've had uh, just recently and all the damage in North Jersey, the unfortunate damage were a common uh, ish problem with the railroads. The famous wreck of the Blue Comet in uh, Chatsworth, you're just south of Chatsworth, was uh, caused by a similar situation like this, where the train, heavy train went over the track and derailed because of the lack of support from the washout. Then this is the Parker Town Station. Again, some of the stations were not much more than a lean-to or a shed, just meant to provide rudimentary shelter. You can liken them to like New Jersey Transit's little uh, metal and glass shelters that you have along the road compared to some of the bigger stations you might have elsewhere. Then once you get to Tuckerton, uh, what was Railroad Ave curves um, to the east towards Route 9, but the railroad would have went straight ahead and then after a slight curve would have arrived at what's now the Greenwood Cemetery. Actually, the Greenwood Cemetery existed when the Tuckerton Railroad was uh, established in 1871. The railroad bought three acres of land from the cemetery uh, for its uh, terminal facilities, uh, passenger station, freight house, um, uh, engine house, a pair of engine houses for to uh, store and repair the locomotives. And then this structure, uh, this is another coal trestle similar to the one we saw in Barnegat, although that one was for um, commercial use to sell coal. This one was for storing coal for the railroad's own use for burning in the steam locomotives. 
So here you have a shot of the piers. Now they're, they have a less glamorous use by the uh, cemetery for storing debris and landscape materials. But you could see each pier is a little bit taller than the next one. And the ones that have been removed in what would have been the foreground by the gate came down even lower. So the hopper cars could be backed up onto here and uh, then dumped coal in for the railroad's use. Going back, you'll see the last three piers were incorporated into a shed by the cemetery when they purchased the land back from the railroad at the railroad's demise. So that's where they store mowers and other equipment. But you could still see the piers, the two that stick out from the building and the one, you could see the mark of the one that was had the angle portion removed. Then at this point in um, uh, 1872, the year after the railroad was purchased, we mentioned when we looked at the map at the very beginning, the Edge Cove spur that went to Edge Cove on um, Little Lake Harbor Bay. So this was one of the several small steamboats that were owned by the railroad. And as I said, they originally took people from that landing. Uh, it was only about a two mile spur from the railroad uh, where the cemetery is now, but these boats took people from that landing to um, Holgate, where Bond's house was, and then later it took them to Beach Haven for the new resorts. There were also uh, horse and mule drawn uh, tramways or rail lines to take people from the railroad station or the landing to the hotels, and at least even one small uh, steam engine was before the railroad came to the island, one small steam engine was used on those tramways as well as livestock, but it must have not proved very efficient because it was only used for a short time. And then horses or mules brought people to the station, to the uh, uh, hotels after that point. Now, when the railroad trestle was built to Long Beach Island in Manahawken in uh, 1886, uh, this line was no longer used. For a very short time, it was used for emergencies when there was damage or ice or some other problem on the, the trestle or, or that line. But soon it was not needed and it was leased to a uh, clam dealer from Tuckerton and he would buy clams from the various clamors on the bay that would bring them to the landing. And um, it's the story passed down that the clamors rigged up a old abandoned flat car from the Tucker and Railroad with a sail. And with their knowledge of sailing with, against and sideways to the winds, they were able to sail this car up the tracks and coast right into the station. I've heard some historians, including uh, John Brickman in his book, have a little bit of skepticism to this story since there's no photographs of it, no one, been a long time since anyone was still alive who would have remembered it but it's one of those legends that's uh, earned a, a pretty solid place in our uh, history and it's more likely that uh, for us skeptics that this was also pulled by horses and mules which would have been probably more efficient but it's not outside the realm of possibility so we like to think about this along with other legends like the Jersey Devil and so forth. Now, if you drive down Route 539 or um, North Green Street, uh, on the left side, if you're coming south, you'll see a little br a brown building. It's a daycare center, Kangaroo Court Daycare. And if you pull into the park, pull onto Railroad Ave, aptly named, and pull into Kangaroo Court's uh, parking lot and turn around, this is the view you would have. Uh, today, it's a building that's now somewhat abandoned, but when I took this picture, they were manufacturing uh, cement lawn uh, uh, statues and bird baths, things like that. But if you look just to the left of the building, it's hard to see in this image, a little better in the, um, in the winter or after the, the leaves have fallen, but there's a dirt road that goes into the woods. This was the right of way of the railroad, and the Tuckerton Railroad ended right at this spot. So this is an old postcard uh, taken from pretty much the same spot I took that prior picture, but looking towards that location. Uh, somebody corrected me once when I was giving this pro 
uh, presentation saying it was the Mount Holly station, not the Tuckering station, but this is actually a poster for the Mount Holly Fair that's on the side of the building, which the Mount Holly County Fair, which where, where it was held. So this is the passenger station. This is one of the engine houses. And here's the uh, a switch that directed the cars or the locomotives into the engine house where they'd be either stored or uh, serviced. And then the freight house is to the rear. There was also a siding here for uh, Newberry's Lumber Company, which later became Tuckerton Lumber, which still exists. So that was served by the railroad back in the day. And in um, 1935, uh, it was decided that the Tuckerton Railroad was just not making enough traffic. There was a little bit of pickup in business um, right after World War I, but then the automobile started to compete too effectively for passengers going to um, Long Beach Island. In 1914, the auto bridge was built, the current causeway. So that brought people to the island as well as the competition for the roads along the main line. And of course, trucks were being used for hauling materials. So the Tuckerton Railroad was in dire straits and it, it was pretty much bankrupt and it was purchased at auction by a company called the H.E. Uh, Salzburg Company, which was a, a salvage company in New York. And it purchased the railroad with the intent of either operating at a profit or scrapping what it could. So after a few years of functioning from 1936 to 1940, under the name Southern Railroad of New Jersey, um, it, that ended up ceasing operation. And in 1940, all service on the railroad ended. The uh, Long Beach Island section had ended in 1935 due to a nor'easter wiping out over 4,000 feet of the trestle. So already at that point, only the main line was still in operation. So in late 1940, uh, salvage started to occur. You can see the ties in front of the station here missing their, their steel rails. They had just been taken up. And here's another picture from the uh, north side of the station, looking at the engine house and the uh, passenger station. And again, you see the ties and can just see the imprint where the rails were. And this grass had been growing up through the, the abandoned ties and rails at that point. So the last shipment on the Tarkerton Railroad by rail was in January of 1941 of scrap metal. And after that, the railroad was um, no more. Here's a few uh, shots taken long after abandonment of structures that were left. This is in Tuckerton. Uh, it's now in the woods now. There's nothing really left of this. This is the water tower or water tank for the steam engines. This is the freight house, which if you were standing where that uh, coal trestle was in the cemetery and looking for, at the corner uh, on the other side of the fence at the corner of the cemetery property, you would see the remnants of this just inside the tree line. And this is what it looks like. It was last rebuilt with creosote timbers and uh, uh, pilings going into the ground. So it's lasted quite a long time. I took this picture about 15 years ago. I would be, imagine, I haven't been back there in a while. I imagine it's deteriorated a little bit more since then. And where the engine house was, there's even less left. There's some creosoted foundation boards or sill boards. And also some of the foundation was brick and Jersey sandstone, which is a typical foundation of material throughout Ocean County, including Tuckerton. As a naturalist, uh, I also have to note a couple plants in this image. One of them is this one deciduous plant still having its leaves. When I was in the Boy Scouts, uh, the poem I learned was leaflets three, let it be berries white poisonous site. So this is our friend poison ivy, um, not so friendly. And then there's a, a pretty little uh, fern growing out of the stone. This is ebony spleenwort. And ebony spleenwort is a native plant to the pine barrens, but unlike the majority of pine barrens plants, it prefers a more basic than acidic soil. 
so the lime in the mortar of old foundations and chimneys and such uh, will often encourage this plant to grow. Sometimes it's not even growing from the rocks. It's growing in a line or even an angled, angled line or square where the foundation once was because the impact of that mortar or line on the soil can last centuries. So this, for archeologists, this is a clue to past human impact. Then on the south side of Railroad Ave on the property of Kangaroo Court, if you're driving down uh, Green Street and look to your, driving south and look to your left, just as you pass the building, the daycare center, you'll see a tan colored wall with handprints, which, you know, associated with the kids there. And if you look on the other side of that, you will see piers of various heights. And this is another coal trestle. And like the one in Barnegat, this was a uh, coal trestle for commercial use where Kangaroo Court is now. It was once a uh, hardware and a coal dealer. So this was used, a, a private spur went across the road and serviced this commercial facility. And this is another, uh, the southernmost actual structure on what was the Tuckerton Railroad. And that brings us to the end. Uh, I just want to thank some of these organizations and individuals that uh, were my source of images and information. Uh, if you want to learn more about this, the book by John Brinkman, The Tuckerton Railroad, it's been out of print for a long time, but you can find it in many of our local libraries. And if you want to pay a lot of money, um, you can find it sometimes on eBay or Amazon or other uh, sources of used books. Another book I highly recommend on South Jersey Railroad history is The Trail of the Blue Comet, published by the uh, National Railroad, Histor the West Jersey chapter of the National Railroad Historical Society. And it's another one that's been out of print for a while, but you can find it on the used market from time to time. It's a very large book. And it's probably the single best source of information on South Jersey railroad history. All right, that was great. A lot of great information, German. Thank you, and and some really awesome photos too. Real, really interesting. Well, thank you. All right. So, if anyone has any questions, whoops. Yeah, if you have any questions, you can either pop them in the chat, we can read them off, or uh, feel free to take yourself off mute as well and um, ask your questions that way if you'd like. Caitlin? Yes. Hi, it's Kathleen Spain. Um, Kathleen. German, thank you very much. This was a great presentation. I love railroads, any kind of railroads. Mm -hmm. And I was typing all these questions to poor Caitlin. I think you answered most of them. But I'm, I'm still a little curious as to this was a passenger, most of the time it was a passenger service, but it sounds like there was freight all, uh, near a lot of the line um, that was either, was it either using that line, were they sharing the same line or were they the freight line and the passenger trains right next to each other? Yeah, it would have been the same railroad. Um doing both passenger and freight. It okay. wasn't until um, the failure of the major Northeast railroads in the late 20th century when you had lines separated. So uh, Conrail was created by the government in 1976 for uh, freight traffic and then Amtrak for interstate passenger. And then the individual like New Jersey Transit, PATCO, things like that uh, for passenger. But up to that time, most railroads, they would have done both, and it would right. have been on the same line. Well, I think that's interesting because I'm from New England, and they always had separate lines uh, because the tracks would be different sized. So it's interesting that they were smart when they were building the this railroad that they thought about the fact that, you know what, yeah. keeping it the same size so that the other question I asked Caitlin was I know you sent you showed us a picture of a reproduction of a railroad car but you said that wasn't used on that line I just wondered how large the passenger cars would have been and like how many people would they have held and were they day trippers or were they people that sounded like they were going to the different you know uh buildings and the lodges and stuff like for instance um out here where i live in uh summers point in ocean city we'd have shoe boxers you know that's where they came from they were day trippers 
What about the people that took these passenger services? Were they staying for long weekends? Were they staying for weeks? Because it sounded like they had bags and everything and baggage cars. Yeah, again, it was pretty much both. You, One of the advantages of the railroad is people could get from uh, Philadelphia to Long Beach Island, which for the Tucker and Railroad was the destination, in just a couple hours. So they could have a day trip. But many people, just like today, um, they would take vacations and they might be there for longer periods of time. So um, as I mentioned in the presentation, the railroad investors herself, they created a separate company just to develop Beach Haven. Mm -hmm. And then other investors developed other parts of the, the line after the railroad came to the island. So people could stay for more than one day. So it really, it was a mixture of both. A lot of the fishermen would come for the day and they would bring their catch back with them that day. Um, but other people would stay for longer. Uh, the question, as far as the size of the trains, um, they were they were all what was considered standard size. In the, in the dawn of railroading in this country, you had up to a dozen different gauges, which is the, the width of the tracks. Yep. Uh, and um, eventually okay, they settled on a standard gauge which is what these were. But you okay. still had industrial lines um, that would be narrow gauge, especially mining and logging railroads that would be a narrower gauge. And those would be the ones that would be just some type of freight or moving of materials, not people. Okay, that's beautiful. Thank you very much. I'm kind of familiar with it. I also have a husband who, who collects antique railroad cars. So you understand, I, I kind of understand the gauge. Just one more question, I promise because I sure. could ask you a lot, because this is great, Caitlin, thank you. Um, just give me an idea of what the passenger fare would have been. Um, have you ever seen any passenger fare tables and saw how much it would have cost for them, you know, to take the, the passenger line? I'm just curious. Um, yes, I don't, the exact fare I don't have at the top of my mind, but in John Brinkman's book, he goes into that in great detail. I do know Okay. The, the primary fare from Tucker into Whiting was, I believe, just under two dollars, hmm. and it stayed that for the entire duration okay. of the Tucker and Railroad's existence. But okay. then there were other other fares depended on where you went. If you went from Manahawk into Beach Haven, or or so forth, or from Beach Haven to Barnegat Light, that might be less. But okay. um, the the main fare didn't for the. <laughs> uh, main line from one end to the other had not changed uh, from the beginning to the end. And it was just, just around $2. Thank you very much. I really appreciate this. I do. This is a great lunch and learn. Thanks, Caitlin. Yeah, no problem, Kathleen. Thanks for your questions. Um, is there any other questions for German today? We also have um, a document we wanted to share with you. Um, um, and I'll, I, Paul, did you want to talk about the off the beaten path uh, document? I can share it if you'd like, um, but I'll see if there's any questions first before we get to that. And if something comes up you, you thought about but, or think about later, you can always contact me at Wells Mills Park. Um, it's a uh, if you have something to write with, it's 609-971-3085. And of course, you can get that on, on our, from our website, oceancountyparks.org, um, or even the phone book if you still <laughs> use those. Great, that's good to know. Um, I don't see any other questions or uh, hear anyone coming off mute. So um, we can just uh, mention that um, Off the Beaten Path uh, document real quick. Uh, Paul, if you'd like. Okay, we've, uh, uh, Garmin and, uh, has produced a document for those people who want to go see what's left of um, the Tuckerton Railroad. Um, and there are sections by uh, how to get to each of them and uh, what you can see um, during that trip that you take uh, uh, as you go through it. This is available from Caitlin. Uh, she'll send it to you electronically, um, and um, we encourage you uh, to, if you're really interested in this, to go on German's van trips, where he takes you, I think it's all day, German, isn't it? 
Uh, yeah, it's the better part of a day. Um, better, from, better usually from day. like about eight uh, thirty till maybe four o'clock on this particular trip. Right, right, and you and, you and that will looks see at all everything. of the railroads, not just the Tuckerton. Right. Okay. And so that's all available to you for those that are interested. Share them with people that you know. Um, and uh, we're glad you participated, Garmin. Thank you very much. This was oh, an my excellent pleasure. presentation. Excellent. Yeah, this was fantastic. I'll send this to the uh, emails that everyone used to register for today's program. So, um, all right. Well, thank you once again to everybody for participating. Um, and uh, we will see you at the next Lunch and Learn, hopefully, uh, next month, uh, which is always the second Wednesday of every month. Um, so I believe that is October 13th. Uh, we'll have more details about that lunch and learn topic and all the rest of the lunch and learns um, soon to come. All right. Uh, so thank you, everybody. And enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you again, German, too. You're thank welcome. you, Caitlin. Thank you all. Yep. Yeah. Take care, everybody. Have a great day.